I'm back in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10. It says in Proverbs 1.10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Now remember, this is historically, it's Solomon talking to his son Rehoboam, King Rehoboam, that really made a mess of things, obviously didn't listen to too much that Solomon said, and obviously didn't really put too much care in these Proverbs, must have left them on the shelf or under his bed and let it collect dust as most people do with their Bible. But Solomon's writing this to his son historically. When it says, my son, you could also look at it to your relationship to God spiritually. And it could be from an earthly father to his earthly son as well. Something you would tell your earthly son. And then it's Israel is the son doctrinally. It's God talking to Israel, his son doctrinally. It could be that way. So there's your three applications. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. You know, if God's speaking this to Israel, it could be prophetic in the time of Jacob's trouble. When they're hungry, they're needing to get that mark of the beast. And he's saying, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Or I remember my grandparents telling me when I was younger, you know, they're going to try to get you to do horrible things, drugs, alcohol, things like that. Consent thou not. There's just so many different ways you could look at it. My son of sinners entice thee. Sinners. That word sinners. The word is used to refer to extremely wicked people in the Old Testament. If sinners entice thee. And it's used that way in the Gospels. To refer to extremely wicked people. However, in the New Testament, Romans 3, 22 through 23... It says, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no difference. You know, it's... Uh, when Paul uses it, most times he's using it to refer to everybody. But in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, it's heavily used to refer to extremely wicked people. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. So they entice. That's to tempt to incite. They're trying to get you to do something. James 1.14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. They entice you. Sin is made pretty to entice. They will call evil good and good evil and entice you. Isaiah 5.20 So don't consent to them. That is, don't be of one mind with them. Don't agree with them. And over in Amos 3.3, 3, it says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? You know, when you walk around with people that's doing the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing, when you're walking around with people that everybody knows is into trouble, how could you not expect them to think that you're in agreement with them? Can how, how can two walk together except they be agreed? So stay away from them. A key to wisdom, and wisdom is the principal thing, especially in Proverbs, a key to wisdom is hanging with the right people. In 1 Timothy 6.3, it says, If any man teach otherwise and consent, not to wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness he is proud knowing nothing so don't consent to the words of these people that are up to no good trying to entice you you need to do what Paul says consent to wholesome words and if any man Teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words. 
even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ into the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing. So consent to wholesome words, not to the words of these sinners trying to entice you. Proverbs 16, uh, 29 says, A violent man enticeth his neighbor and leadeth him into the way that is not good. It's all about getting with the right crowd. That's a key to wisdom. They're going to lead you in the way that's not good. There's no other way around it. You see so many people, they get back on track with God. They get back with their friends and they lead them into the way that is not good. It's a lot easier for them to lead you into the way that's not good than it is for you to lead them in the way that is good. Moral, moral of the story is learn to just say no to people that's trying to entice you. Look at verse 11. If they say, notice that phrase, if they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious stuff, substance. We shall fill our houses with, with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. So you see there, if they say they, you see they are usually in a group. These people trying to entice you, they're in a group making you think, well, Everybody's doing this. And notice how many times it says us in here. Come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. So five or six times... You got them saying us. A couple of times they're saying we. It's a group of people, not just one man. And Exodus 23, 2 says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. It doesn't matter if everybody's going that way. You know, the Antichrist, he's going to cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand and in their forehead. Everybody's going to be doing it. Jesus said, you know, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way, which leads to death. And many there be which go in there at. There's going to be a whole bunch of people going in to the broad way to hell. So you don't listen to them. When sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, that's when you turn the other way. It says in verse 11, Come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. So liars in wait. They lie in wait for blood. So they're patient like a serpent. They got all the time in the world. You know that? They don't have to get worry about getting up and going to work in the morning usually. They're out running the streets, doing whatever they want to do. I wonder how much it would cut down on the devil's devilment if he had to get up and go to work at 4 o'clock in the morning, which he is at work doing evil stuff. But imagine if he just had to get up and go to work at a factory every day. He'd probably be causing a lot of trouble there, but on a worldwide scale, I bet it would cut back on some of his devilment. But they lay wait. They're patient like a serpent, like their father. They lurk. Come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk. If you lurk, you, you lie hid privately, privily, secretly. They, they, I mean, they ought to know God sees them, but they have no care that God sees them. They don't even retain God in their knowledge. They're not thinking about God. You know, people do things secretly, privately. You think about somebody like the Golden State Killer, that guy that 
for 30, 40 years, broke into people's houses, did it privately, secretly, and ended up killing people. He didn't retain God in his knowledge, or he would have known that there was a God in heaven watching what he was doing. Even if nobody was detecting him, there's a God in heaven watching him. And they're going to reap what they sow. Because look at verse 18. It says, And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. You see, when you do wrong, and you do wrong to other people especially, you're just reap, going to reap what you sow. You're going to cause it to be brought down back on you. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. So they're laying wait for their own blood. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So look at this. Proverbs 1, 11. Let us lurk privily for the innocent. That sounds about right. That's who they like to go after, the innocent. People that's just walking along, minding their own business, maybe on their way to work, maybe on their way home. You think about these uh, young children that are maybe in the grocery store, uh, maybe in the toy section, got away from their parents a little bit. Here comes stupid. Here comes that old pervert, runs up to them, Snatches them up. They lurked privily for the innocent. And you know what? That's one of the things the Lord hates is hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Look at the things the Lord hates. God hates some things because real love hates some things. You can't love children and be okay with people that are mean to children. You can't do it. Hands that shed innocent blood. One of the things that Lord, the Lord hates. They lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Just basically for no reason at all. If there is a reason, it's for them because they're lazy and, sh and stupid. And they, they really need to get a life and think about other people instead of their self all the time. They lurk privily for the innocent without cause. And it says in Psalm 25, 3, Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Some people just sin and sin and sin for no reason at all. It says in Psalm 35, 7, For without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause have they digged for my soul. So that's Psalm 35, 7. In Proverbs 3.30, it says, Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. Proverbs 3.30. You see that all the time. Somebody just gets killed, a senseless killing. Somebody just gets robbed, a senseless robbing, a senseless kidnapping. Just doing people wrong for no reason. Strive not with a man without cause, if they have done thee no harm. You know, some people do evil for the sake of just being evil. You know, these gangs, they do these gang initiations. They'll have you go do something evil to somebody just to get initiated in the gang. You know, they hated Jesus without a cause. John fifteen twenty five. Now look at verse 12, Proverbs 112, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. So swallow them up alive as the grave. They just want to swallow you whole. There's the common saying. Swallow you whole. First Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil has a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to swallow you up. The Lord said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And during the tribulation, 
prophetically looking at this, there will be a famine. And this is going to cause this verse to take on an even more literal sense. In Psalm 14.4, it says, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? The Antichrist and the workers of iniquity are going to stay alive during that famine through swallowing up God's people. There'll be a sacrifice, and then they'll swallow them up. It says, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. Like Korah in Numbers 16.30, he went down alive into the pit. It says he went down quick. Quick means alive. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as though that as those that go down into the pit we shall find all precious substance it says in verse 13 we shall fill our houses with spoil you see precious substance things that are truly precious cannot be stolen the, the things that you have that are truly precious cannot be stolen the blood of the lord jesus first peter 1 19 the precious blood of christ that cannot be taken away from you. That's on your soul forever. They can't take it away. We're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold received from the vain tradition of our fathers, but by the precious blood of Christ, of a land without blemish and without spot. First Samuel 3, 1 Samuel 3.1 says, The word of the Lord was precious in those days, for there was no open vision. The word's precious, and you hide the word in your heart. Nobody can take that away. So you focus on filling your life with things that can't be taken away. Oh, and uh, when you get your glorified body, it's going to have precious things. In 2 Corinthians 5.2, it says, Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. You need to be thinking about being clothed upon with your glorified body. 2 Corinthians 5, 3. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Be worried about trying to cover up your glorified body with precious things. 1 Corinthians three twelve. Now, if any man built upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones. See, the moment you got saved, you started building your building that you're going to present to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're either building with wood, hay, and stubble, or you're building with gold, silver, and precious stones. If you're building with gold, silver, and precious stones, the building is going to survive the fire that the Lord tries it with at the judgment seat of Christ, and you're going to get that gold, silver, and precious stones back. And over there in Ezekiel 28, 13, talking about Lucifer, it said every precious stone was his covering. So no wonder he's so jealous of you, trying to trip you up. He used to have some precious stones as his covering. Now he's trying to keep you from having precious stones as your covering. So your obedience in this life could result in your glorified body being covered with precious stones and ornaments of grace. Just as Lucifer was clothed in his in his original state. Now the average man is only concerned with filling his earthly house with temporal things. These sinners that say lay, that lay wait for blood and lurk privily for the innocent without cause and want to swallow you up alive as the grave, they're only worried about filling their houses with precious substance, filling their houses with spoil that they stole from somebody else. And the stuff they stole from somebody else is not only going to burn up, but if they don't get saved, they're going to burn up one day. But that's Proverbs 1, 10 through 13. I'll go ahead and stop there. Not really meaning for these to go long. And we'll pick up with verse 14 next time.